in stories um, how to embed sustainability in schools. Um, for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm um, Astrid Jacobi, um, have founded Little Hands 20 years ago, hence the birthday party today. have meanwhile handed it over about a year ago to our new director, Georgie Rees, and have moved with um, my partner in crime to Kazakhstan. Um, completely coincidental, there's no prehistory with Kazakhstan and our family or anything. We just stumbled over this British school in Almaty where I now work as the sustainability coordinator and uh, Mike works as the deputy head academic, so he's in charge of all things curriculum. I'm in charge of all things um, sustainability, which means it's quite convenient because um, we have a, a big playground to play on. Uh, Mike is also a physics teacher, uh, which comes in quite handy because um, he can often talk about the science behind everything. Now, before we really dive into the specifics of the title SDGs in Stories, um, I think we need some background, if you, next slide, um, before we can do that. So over the last decade or so, more and more people and institutions have started talking about sustainability and becoming increasingly uh, concerned with what we now call the climate and ecological crisis. And as this has become more mainstream, so have some worrying trends, which we believe often lead to unintended consequences and barriers to progress. The first one is to do with definition. Sustainability is now such an overused word. I'm kind of almost bored about it. Um, but um, it seems that a lot of people have just substituted it for the word environmentalism. And that leads to a failure to really look at what is at the core of sustainability, which is first and foremost the relationships we humans have with each other, which then results in the relationships we have with the natural world. And the, the misinterpretation and taking sustainability as pure environmentalism is, is a little bit like just treating the symptoms and not the causes. Next. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry. I, I <laughs> So yeah, and, and okay, right. So that is a uh, number one problem. Number two problem, um, a lot of the sustainability discussion is centered around consumerism. It's basically saying, you know, just carry on buying, just buy differently. And we are made to believe that we can save the world with a bamboo toothbrush in our left hand and a keep cup in our right hand. And I don't think I need to go into that, why that is fundamentally wrong. Um, number three uh, is what I call the guilt trip. The whole sustainability thing is shrouded in negativity, in, um, in moral dilemmas, in this picture of a life of sacrifice. We're day daily bombarded with disaster scenarios, unimaginable statistics, um, next slide, plus a hefty dose of judgmentalism, which leads to people being anxious, feeling overwhelmed, um, which in itself then what's the most human response to when you're anxious, when you're overwhelmed, you switch off, you turn away, you disengage. Um, and the last one is a particular point, uh, one more. And next slide. Sorry. Um, the last one is particular poignant uh, for pedagogues, for teachers. Um, it's what we call sustainability illiteracy. So all of us have basically gone, apart from the young lady, through an education system which hasn't equipped us with the knowledge, understanding or behavioural patterns um, to recognise the apparent negative consequences of our actions. And especially as teachers, I think we need to be aware of that. Um, and especially our generation, we need to embrace that and learn how to turn that into literacy and then be able to lead by example in the classroom. Now, one thing we came up continuously in Kazakhstan at the British School there is stress. Oh my God, we're dealing with, pan with the pandemic, with COVID. Why this now? We have loads of other things to do. So at this point, I'm handing over to the physics nerd to give us a little bit about the science background, why we feel that especially because of COVID, we need to seriously think about this. Thank Over you. to you, Mike. 
physics nerd. Right. Um, a couple of charts and no, and no math. And no, 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 don't have to worry about it. No Xs. Um, basically, I, we, we've come across it a few times where you're trying to explain to people what the urgency is. And the, the urgency really for sustainability is centered around climate change. Um, there are lots and lots of other areas of sustainability which we're going to talk about, but climate change is the one which is really ha has the most pressure. And it's kind of hard to explain climate change because the climate is very, very complicated. But I wanted to show just a couple of charts, which I hope kind of get the message across in the easiest way. I think if you've seen these charts, you kind of know everything you, you need to know. So apologies, uh, apologies for a little bit of, uh, a little bit of science. But um, in any case, um, this is a chart of long-term carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere and actually goes back 800,000 years. So this, is, um, this has come from things like obviously relatively recent studies, but also stuff where they've dug up ice cores from the Antarctic and they can really look back at the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And what people always say is, well, there's lots of variability. It's always naturally a lot of variability. If you just click twice, please. Click twice, another one. Yeah. So absolutely right. So we can see that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere really has varied quite a lot over the last 800,000 years. Absolutely fine. The only problem with this is if you look where we are now. So we are now outside of the region where we have been between about 200 or 175 and about 280, 290 parts per million. We're now at 415, although this is actually a bit old. This is 2016 data. We're actually now up to about 420, 421 parts per million. So whatever you want to say about the natural variability of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we are way, way, way outside this. And we've actually come incredibly quickly. In fact, we've come since the start of the Industrial Revolution. So if someone talks about the natural variability of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you can completely agree with them. You can also agree that we are way, way, way outside of the bounds where we've been for the last almost one million years. One more slide, please. OK, so this slide is the kind of corollary of the other side. Apologies for the lots of other kind of things on there. There's lots of colors on there. The thing you want to look at is the black line. And the black line now talks about global average temperatures. So these again, now this is only about 12,000 years. This is us coming out of the last ice age, okay? And since then, we've really only moved about plus or minus a quarter of a degree from the average temperature. OK, which is still had large variations in temperature across the globe. However, this is where we were now in 2016. Again, we are way, way, way outside of the bounds that we've had before. And again, it's happened very, very, very recently since the start of the Industrial Revolution. Indeed, this is where the Paris Accord would like us to not exceed, which is one and a half degrees. And unfortunately, this is where we're probably going to, which is beyond one and a half degrees in raising temperatures. So hopefully with these two charts, we can see that this has happened very recently. It's way outside of the bounds of all the variability we've had before, and it's man-made. And I think that's the thing which we all stumble over. That's the kind of sticking point. It's all because of what we've been doing for the last 150 years. Thanks, next chart. OK, so what's the problem? That's, that's OK. In fact, I'll show you a chart in a second, because obviously living in the UK, we all think, well, a bit, having it a bit warmer, a bit less rain and a bit warmer might be a great thing. So we'll talk about that in a second. But the problem with this is, and this is the reason why there is an urgency, which is the climate is very complicated. And it, in complicated systems, we have these things called tipping points. A tipping point is where the system suddenly changes what it looks like with only a very small change in what's going on in it. And that sounds kind of complicated, but it's a bit like the straw that broke the camel's back. You can add a straw and add a straw and add a straw and nothing really changes, but suddenly with one extra straw at some point, everything changes. And this chart here gives some of the particular tipping points which we are worried about and things like the Amazon rainforest, the Arctic sea ice melting, coral reefs, etc. But I wanted to talk about something a bit more closer to home to kind of really bring this to us. So we are absolutely worried about all of these things. Any of these things could lead to a very big change in our weather. But 
This is the one which I think is the one closest to home. Here we are in London, and it's quite, you know, we have quite decent weather here. It's very, it's very mild. It never gets too cold in the winter, kind of average five degrees. It never gets too hot in the summer, as we're finding out this summer. And here we are at St. John's, just off the coast of Newfoundland. And it's basically the same latitude that we are. Okay, so it's no further north and no further south than London, approximately. But if we look at the weather in the winter, it's dramatically different. It's about the same in the summer, but it's dramatically different in the winter. And you might ask yourself, well, why is this? Just next slide. And the reason is that we have these very deep um, um, uh, conveyor belts of warm and cold water. We have cold water coming down from the Arctic and we have warm water coming up from the Atlantic, and there's the famous Gulf Stream. And luckily for us, we're on the side with the warm water, and they're on the side with the cold water, which is why it's so much colder there in winter. The problem is that one of the effects of climate change, this is because we are dumping huge amounts of fresh cold water in the, Ar in the Arctic, it's actually weakening these streams of warm water to us. And if we lost, the stream of water coming up here, we would suddenly be having the same kind of winter that they're having. So minus 10 to minus 15 degrees in the winter in London. So when someone says to you, oh, global warming, it'd be lovely if London was a couple of degrees warmer. Unfortunately, because the climate is very complicated, one of the effects of global warming could be that London becomes enormously colder. And indeed, weather fluctuations which we're starting to have already in the world, extreme weather events, much more common than they used to be. That is another unfortunate consequence. Last slide, please. Okay, so that's why we're worried, why there's really an urgency to really get to grips with what's going on. Now, I wanted to talk just for a minute about pedagogy because obviously Astra and I are both teachers um, and in schools there's been and there has been growing, no doubt about it, even over the last 10 years, and just increasing pressure on teachers and schools to react to, in the first case, climate change. And certainly things like the Fridays for Futures movement, um, the kind of recycling, no plastic, no single use plastic has really, um, has kind of really put the pressure on schools and on teachers to kind of come up with a decent reaction to this. And the reaction which Astrid has kind of championed at Halebury, and in fact, we looked at this, um, she looked at this quite deeply before we, we went out to Kazakhstan, was to use the framework of the sustainability goals to actually give us a framework to actually work in as pedagogues. Now, the sustainability goals have a lot of benefits, which I just want to go into a bit before I give it back to Astrid. Um, there are 17 goals. They come from the United Nations. They've been, they've been signed up to by all the countries of the United Nations. So these are very, very kind of um, expansive in terms of the people, the recognition. Um, and I think that's one definite benefit to us. Lots of schools around the world now are championing, running um, and following the sustainability goals. They're also very broad. So they give us really a chance to look at not just climate change, which is only one of the goals on there, but they look, allow us to look at communities, at gender equality, at poverty, at lots and lots of things where both teachers and, and school children would want to get involved in. So this gives us a really broad and gener generic way to kind of attack the whole road of sustainability and also to show the connections because all of these goals are actually connected and when you're looking at one you're really looking at all of them because climate change is a goal which affects poverty um, which affects gender equality as well once you actually think about it good okay I think that's enough for me I will hand right. it back to Astrid so back to the school setting um, what do we actually mean when we talk about sustainable illit sustainability literacy what, what picture do you have if you hear, oh, this is an eco school, a green school, or whatever other program is, there, is around there? Um, and when you start asking people, pupils, teachers, parents, the picture which ar uh, arises is, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a group of pupils who are really active, canvassing for recycling schemes at school, for less meat in school dinners, maybe a school garden, etc. It's seen as a very positive, sometimes even necessary, but still as an add-on to what is already a really busy school life. And if you carry on that thought, what, that, what does that mean? What role do we as pedagogues have if 
things like that are seen as an add-on, often restricted to extracurriculum activities. Um, and is that approach not a little bit like we, the generation who caused most of the damage Mike was just describing, onto the shoulders of children? And I've lost my thread there. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm sure you've heard this before. It's a, a lot of people keep saying, oh, it's the young ones, they will solve this. It's the younger generation. And I find that quite dubious um, as a pedagogue, because would we say the same thing about math and English literacy? No parent, no teacher in the right mind would say, oh, it's the younger generation who are going to solve this. Yet we're doing it when we come to sustainability. Now, there's been a theory around, well, interestingly enough, about the same time as scientists have told us about the negative um, consequences of our action. Um, it's called Education for Sustainable Education Pedagogy. It's now been formally adopted by UNESCO since 2015 and informs all the educational work. Um, and it rests on three pillars. The cognitive domain, which is basically knowledge transfer, which is the very sort of traditional education approach, the socio-emotional domain and the behavioral domain. What I find really interesting about this is, if you look at it, two-thirds of this pedagogy rests on emotions and on behavior. And that gives you a really, really strong hint of why we are still now more than ever at a critical point when it comes to the climate crisis. Um, next slide. So to dive into it a little bit deeper, um, like any theory of pedagogy, you're talking about competencies of what you as a teacher are trying to develop with your students. And if you look at the competencies, one I find really, really um, interesting is the anticipatory competency. Because what that does is it says, we should teach and learn to predict consequences based on a variety of scenarios. And if you do that in your teaching and you do that with your students in the learning, you, you basically need to get out of your subject silo. You need to teach across the faculties and you're reaching a lot more than just an understanding of pure environmental issues, which leads back to the 17 SDGs and that the actual problem is the relationship between us humans. Okay, uh, next one. So theories are all very well. What does that look like in practice? So what we've done at um, Haleable Real Marty is we've introduced the 17 um, Sustainable Development Goals and we try to do this in a way that it addresses those trends, concerning trends I talked about in the beginning. Um, you can imagine each teacher normally only teaches one or two subjects. You say to them, oh, well, just embed 17 goals on top of everything else. That feels overwhelming. So what we said to the uh, teaching body is don't focus on what you teach. We've got that covered. We've got a curriculum to follow. Look at and focus on how you teach it and just twist the angle. Because anything we teach, whether it's Shakespeare or design and technology, you can find links to those 17 things because they are so inclusive. Um, and then focus on just two or three of those 17 goals, those which either are very relevant to your subject or to your personal concerns. And then um, acknowledge that because of that, because we're all focusing on slightly different things, um, we can have different priorities. And for me, that was a really important one because of that judgmentalism. Um, you can imagine someone whose job title is sustainability coordinator. I get called out any time, every time I do something. People say, but you eat meat, but you fly. And it's that judgmentalism which is really, really paralyzing for us to move forward in a sort of humankind team. Okay, and then the, uh, the, the, the next one, which um, we feel very strongly about, is the positive. The making it clear to people working in an institution, how much more interesting and fun and surprising it is if you actually work together as a team with a common purpose and based on, you may have heard that from the transition movement, on the what-if approach. Imagine 
every time you come up with a challenge, people would react and say, okay, so what if this could work? What actually happens in a lot of schools, a lot of institutions, people first think about, oh, what could go wrong? And again, that's a very, very paralyzing approach um, to something which is, in, you know, for all intents and purposes, solvable. Okay, I go on further. And um, from that, we obviously had to take account of uh, the COVID situation. So we did a really, really soft launch. We looked at behavioral theory and the, the idea of what do you need to do if you want to change your daily habits or if you want to introduce a new habit. No different from someone saying, I want to lose some weight, I want to stop drinking alcohol or whatever. And behavioral theory mm -hmm. says you need to do this new habit every day for about a month, just a tiny nudge. And then you have a chance of it becoming like second nature. So our phase one at the school, and this is where we are still very much at, is the forming daily habits so that we can um, test out things. It's almost like a sort of hands-on action research phase of good practice, what works, what doesn't work. Little things where you, you teach a lesson and you think, oh, could I have a little nudge there to one of the SDGs? Um, we've combined that with an introduction of one SDG per month to make it a little bit more tangible. We then want to look at actually building up a, a good practice guide um, and looking more at the cognitive uh, side of things to then hopefully at some stage reach stage three where we can formally uh, adopt the good practice guide and um, embed things in a more formal way into the curriculum. Now, I did say something, we wanted something positive, surprising, more interesting. So what we did is we specifically didn't want to focus on cognitive development because that's what we teachers are anyway really good at, you know, knowledge transfer. That's what everyone expects us to do. You need to teach my child, you need to build up knowledge. So we wanted something which takes the teachers out of their comfort zone, which has a sort of element of surprise um, and teamed up as two professional storytellers, one in New Zealand, Tanya Bhatt, and one in the UK, Marian Lipa, and looked at traditional folk tales and have narrowed it down to 17 folk tales and rewritten each one of those to explain the meaning of each individual goal. Um, and basically what we're trying to achieve with that, and we've already had some brilliant success stories with our work with Little Hands Design, is to really focus on that socio-emotional and, 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 and behavioral um, domain of um, education for sustainable development, because we have the knowledge. That is not the problem. It's the connecting here, that it becomes part of our nature, part of what we are as humans to think about how we relate to each other and how we relate to us as being part of nature. Now, next one. Um, so every month at the school, we're introducing one goal with a story, which we also do uh, with a little video where someone reads out the story. We had the headmaster reading out. We had a drama class acting it out. Um, we want to show you one example for SDG 5, um, gender equality. Yeah, it's called um, A Wedding Dress for the Moon. Um, and I don't want to say too much about it. Have a look at it. Let it just sort of, you know, um, wash over you and then while I carry on from after yeah, that. Open. Yeah, that's it. You just need to read yeah. yeah. Now the sun, of course, sees everything, everything in the whole world, every plant, every creature, every bird, everything except for one thing, the darkness. And they say that once, at the beginning of time, the sun was heading over towards the horizon, when over his shoulder he spotted something he'd never seen before, a little white crescent. And as the evening wore on, he saw it 
light up with a beautiful silver light. It was, of course, the moon. I wonder if you've seen the moon in daylight. When I was young, they called it the children's moon. The sun fell in love. He shouted across the sky to the moon. Moon, I'm going to marry you. You will come and live with me and be mine forever. The moon is quite busy. She has a job of her own. She has to look after the tides. She has to walk through the night and give light to the creatures there. She didn't want to get married at all. No, I will not marry you, she said to the sun. I have different things to do. Well, the sun was furious. He sent out great flames of scarlet and orange and gold shooting across the sky. Moo, you will get married to me, he said. I'm stronger than you and I've said so. The moon was terrified. If I get any closer to him, he will sizzle me up to nothing, she thought. But at night, when the moon shines, that's when people come out and tell stories. And the moon has listened to all those old stories with their cunning plans and clever tricks. And she came up with an idea. Son, I can't marry you, she said. I have nothing to wear. The sun said, I will make you a splendid golden wedding dress. You will have to fit me absolutely perfectly, said the moon. The sun loved this challenge. He went around the world looking for yellow and golden things. I'm sure you can think of lots of yellow things, but there's a lot right here in the garden. Irises and lilies and this beautiful flower that the bees love so much. And he took all these yellows and he wove them together and he made the most wonderful dress and he spread it out across the sky and he called to the moon. Moon, come and look at your dress. But when the moon appeared in the sky, she wasn't a thin little cylinder anymore. She was perfectly round. I can't wear this dress, she said. I will never fit into it. Well, the sun had loved the moon when she was a little thin crescent. He loved her four times as much. Now she was beautiful and round. So he set off to make her a little dress. He hung lemons and bananas and golden butter and he wove them into a beautiful dress and he called her once more but this time when the moon came to look half of her was round the other half was flat so the sun had to start all over again and from that day to this the sun is still making dresses for the moon and the moon is still changing shape. Right. So that is one of 17 stories. Um, I admit when I first read this, I was a little bit, hmm, gender equality, moon, sun. But actually, when you start thinking about it, there's so many layers which you can age appropriately bring into every year from junior to senior school, body image, balance of power, our relationship to clothes, etc., etc. We obviously don't just blast out a story and a video. We have follow-up questions which help people getting into that space of not just reading and thinking, oh well, um, but really engaging with it. We do a monthly um, CPD training for teachers, um, next slide, where we discuss in groups, what does that mean in your local setting, that SDG, what does it mean on global scale, um, how can we 
have these little daily nudges, because remember that is phase one, little nudges every day. How can we you know, tr let them trickle into the classroom? Um, now, before we go to um, a question and answer, two things. So Fridays for Futures, the kids are out on the street. They're saying to us, what's the point of going to school if we may not have a world tomorrow? And I strongly believe that the answer lies in the way we educate ourselves and we're educating others, whether that is children, people we work with, our friends and our families. Because if we continuously learn ourselves how to protect and regenerate the world, but also how to adapt to those damages which are already there, irreversible, then that gives a why school is important, why education is important. And I think we need that motivation to know why we are learning something. And I think ESD, Education for Sustainable Development, gives us that framework within those 17 goals. Now, um, I think to round it off, what would be quite interesting maybe for you guys is just to hear Mike um, giving a few observations of how that was greeted at the school. How did the staff take this on? Maybe a couple of sticking points because it is not plain sailing. Um, over to you. Okay. Yeah, so um, 17 SDGs is, as Astra said, quite a lot to kind of confront teachers with. Teachers are actually a very conservative bunch, uh, not voting necessarily wise, but certainly in their attitudes to change and also, um, you know, quite hardworking, but also quite, um, quite sensitive to the amount of work which they're being given. So um, it has, as Astra said, not been particularly plain sailing. So some of the things which have actually worked quite well is that certainly teachers have been able to kind of identify some of the SDGs in their own, uh, in their own subjects and have been able to run with them once they understood that they had the freedom to really, you know, to go, to go for it. So some obvious things like in geography, uh, in economics, you know, you really can get involved in that. In fact, one really interesting one I, I think is actually in PE where, um, we, ha we have a mixed school, girls and boys, and body image is, is, is already a well-known problem there. And they've really, um, they've really grasped the gender equality one as, as one to really run with. So I think, I think there have been some kind of notable areas of success, uh, but it has, it has definitely been a challenge. And one of the challenges has been, for example, to make this really a, something which becomes a daily nudge because, um, people have a lesson plan or they've got lessons they already want to do, they know what they want to say, and now they're having to divert a little bit away or find connections for themselves. So one, one thing which I, I've tried to help them with is, you know, as a physics teacher, you kind of think to yourself, mm, you know, like where's, where's gender equality in physics, right? Surely that's, that's not somewhere where you can really go to town on it. But funnily enough, Unfortunately, there are many, many examples of uh, women physicists who have made really great strides forward, certainly women scientists in general, but even women phys physicists as Henry and Henrietta swan Leavitt, who did all the work for Hubble, who discovered that the universe was expanding, the Hubble constant with all that work was done at Harvard by, by a woman. She did all the analysis for him. Um, there's Emmy Noether, who's a very famous mathematician, who did all the work which gives us all the fundamental physics we use now. The idea of symmetries in physics is a fundamental idea, comes from, comes from all her work. So actually, it's relatively straightforward, actually, to do that when you, when you make that leap, when you actually start looking for it. Um, the problem is that, as Astrid said, really, um, especially in secondary schools more than in primary, we really work in subject silos. You know, you have a physics teacher and a math teacher and an English teacher, a geography teacher, and they really are not very practiced at looking outside of their silo for those kind of connections. And because of the nature of sustainability and the interconnectedness of these things, you do need to start looking outside your subject silos. And this is something which I think we're, de we're definitely still working on as a way of you know, taking, and also obviously you're very focused on exams if you're looking at GCSEs and A-level. So you, you do need to find the time and you do need to have the idea that you can look outside your subject silos. But once you get the students talking about it, 
I think we've both found there's an appetite on their side to actually involve themselves in it. But it's definitely not a straightforward thing where you can come in and it's just embraced all round. And um, we've, yeah, we've had a Lots year of, of work to do. Have a year I, of. Uh, I mean, thought it'd be good to leave a few minutes for any questions, answers, discussions, comments. So it comes to mind, I don't know whether this is a question or not, but it's just kind of response, if you like. I very clearly remember reading about 40, I'm 63 years old, and about about 40 something years ago, a book about China. Mm -hmm. And apparently it said at that point, they was, the country as a whole, and you know whether these statistics are correct or not, I don't know, but I was this is what I was reading. They actually recycled 80% of their waste, mm -hmm. uh, partly because they lived in these kind of small kind of community type places where they maybe had one television. And now looking, looking, you know, forward uh, 45 years later, you know, it, you know, China's probably one of the most polluted uh, places on earth. And it, it's interesting to see just within that short space of time, how they've gone from uh, what I would call the spirit that you're trying to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, enlighten us about, which, which they they had. I mean, what I'm really saying, China was probably the most one of the most greenest country, you know, to, per head of population at that point, according to what I read. And now it's now it's not. So it seems that there's a kind of almost like a disease and a contamination that can takes place within human society, this might relate to physics, that, mm -hmm. that once it gets hold and it gets a grip, it really, you know, it just kind of, like a virus or something, it spreads right through. Yeah. And, you know... I think that's a really, but, really good yeah. analogy, this, this kind of virus and spreading. And that works in the positive as well. Yeah. I find if you are positively doing this nudging, it right. starts becoming like a virus. Yeah, yeah. I had two library. We have two librarians in, in Kazakhstan in the library, um, Kazakh ladies, um, very well educated, but have not really um, been exposed to the big sustainability discussion. They heard globally, but it didn't really mean anything to them personally. The day before I left, they came to me and said, Astrid, this is just amazing. I now use a keep cup. I've never even thought about stuff like that before. And you can see how at the level of the normal teacher and staff, it is spreading like a virus. Yeah. And the other interesting thing I find is China always comes up. And this is something which I find quite interesting and which a lot of people are trying to push through. If we're looking at why China is polluting the way it is, what we're trying to say is there is a footprint each of us produces. At the moment, countries are ranked according to a geographical footprint, i.e. China is polluting. If that would be changed into a consumption footprint, suddenly all us Western countries who look so clean, like Germany, Denmark, UK, move right down the ladder and China looks massively more positive. And that is, if you think about changing that way of thinking, of not looking and saying, oh, my neighbor is bad. I wished we would all think about our own life and our own world by saying, we need to always tidy up in front of our own doorstep and not look and judge what our neighbors are doing. And that footprint stuff in terms of economy would be a huge thing and hopefully, in not so distant future, we will actually rank countries uh, not on geographical but on the consumption footprint. That's a lovely answer. I mean, um, I mean, I had heard that be before, and but I, I, I wasn't so, um, you, you know, um, uh, focused on what that, that imbalance that you were speaking about. Well, it seems now that China themselves have got the grip of buying stuff and, you know, they're, they're kind of become, they've reached the level where they, they, they've all become, you know, increasingly consumer kind of, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. I mean, China, China are also the far, they're, they're the fastest developer of solar, solar power. So they are, they are going from kind of, 
coal power, kind of very 18th, 19th century Victorian to 21st century, faster than any other country. Yeah. So I think what you're really touching on, there's two things. One is what Astrid talked about, definitely, which is, you know, the reason that China have been so polluting, partly to try and increase the economic, the, the, their own economy, but partly because the West have outsourced a lot of their production to China. So they're producing for us. In a, in, a, in, in a polluting type of way. Uh, the second thing comes down to a, a huge topic, which we can't really touch on now, which is climate justice, which is how do you try and, you know, the West have had 150 years of burning stuff, essentially, to generate our economies. And, you know, that's not, not a criticism. It, that was what the opportunity was, and people didn't wholly understand what the downside was until about 30 or 40 years ago. Um, and what do you do with countries who haven't had that opportunity, who because they haven't been developing in the same way? What do you do with countries who are now feeling very much the downside of that? And, and that whole climate justice and how do you draw something equal across the world is, it's a very, very big discussion. The only thing I would notice, which we were laughing about or talking about, is that um, you might have seen that, um, that Shell have been sued. Uh, they're now obviously, they're an Anglo-Dutch company, but they're now headquartered in, 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 in Rotterdam. And they have been sued in Holland by climate activists and have lost the case. So they now actually are liable to be paying out for their own pollution. Now, unfortunately, this is only valid in that country but but undoubtedly this is going to be another really big thing where global polluters but particularly corporations are going to be held to account a bit like with the asbestos crisis which you you might remember but certainly that 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 brought a lot of people to to you know to, to you know up for what they what they'd been doing um this is going to be another really, really big thing. I think which looking is going at sustainability to... as not, you know, this is a is, is a is a moral thing. It's an it's economics. The whole cradle to cradle to say um, we need to be responsible as a company for the real costs. And you go in a shop and you pay a fiver for a t-shirt, but is that the real cost? And is the company paying the real cost? Um, so you know politics, economics, that is much, much uh, bigger in that whole discussion than whether I need to do this because, you know, I'm, I'm a good person. Um, to, to touch on something Mike said, um, I constantly hear in Kazakhstan people saying, oh, we are so bad, we are so behind. The experts are saying, ah, Kazakhstan, 20 years behind. Ridiculous if you think about it. Because while the Soviet bloc was still there, for 30 years, the West has been consuming senselessly. So yes, they might not have the subtle recycling scheme yet, which we have here in London and the rest of the UK, although that is uh, open to criticism as well. But they have 30 years where they haven't been doing all this consuming. So I, I think for me, the main thing always is this kind of a change of how we view ourselves and what we do ourselves in our countries, in our economies, in our politics, before we do this comparing. Because we don't, I, I don't think that is a very constructive way to look at sustainability. Right, more questions, comments? No? I, I would like to say something on the back of um, consumption. Mm -hmm. It's also the fact that the Western countries also don't take responsibility for their waste and they send it to developing countries. Yeah. So then it doesn't look bad on, like, on, on us, but then just us. It makes the other countries. That, that's what I meant with uh, in front of our own yeah. doorstep, the cradle to cradle. If I produce something, then I also need to be responsible of how it gets disposed. The whole idea of a circular economy. And that is something which is surprisingly hard at a more sort of leadership level to bring through. People our generation have been brought up on the idea of a growth economy. We need to be growing. We always need to be growing. And there are also misdefinitions about what that actually means, but in a very, very crude and simple term, why? Why do we always need to grow and have more if we define growth economy with more? Why shouldn't we be working on 
a, a need spaces instead of a want spaces? Why should we not have as an aim for our working life and our private life to live of what we need and to give back what other people need instead of what we want? Um, so yes, absolutely. Interestingly, China have banned all Western plastic waste from them a couple of years ago, yeah. uh, which is where we were shipping, even in Camden, in fact. This yeah. is where, this is the first place when Camden Recycling started, where Camden's waste was being created off to. Yeah. So again, it's, you know, the world, the, there's an interconnectedness there, which you can't kind of easily get away from um, when you just try and isolate one country and, and look at what they're doing, because, you know, that's, it's a bit more complicated unfortunately than that well i think we've supposed to run out of time yep. now this whole title of developed and underdeveloped is part of the problem because thank you so much that is one of my biggest bugbears is the even the word developed and underdeveloped as if developed. if you live in a country which isn't on the gdp level um supposedly successful as if that is underdeveloped and yet if we look at the wisdom of the indigenous populations, for example, and what they can teach us about our place in nature and how we live, have to live in balance with nature to be able to live ourselves, um, I, it really irks me that kind of developed and underdeveloped. Um, so thank you very much for that point, because I think that is a really, it goes back to this, we need to really change how we look at ourselves um, our nationalities, our countries, our, our way of looking things. Um, I believe we have our next speaker here to come in 10 minutes, the director of the um, London School of Mosaic, and fits very, very neatly on from our lecture because he will be talking about the value of creativity in education.